There's a uh, idea in the world that science and the Bible are at, at a, in a conflict. In reality, since we, all we know of, of God, of the good Lord, is revelation and creation. That's what we've got going for us. We have revelation and creation. In Hebrew, it works very nicely. Torah and Teva, it sounds almost the same. We have the Bible, and we have the creation itself. And the idea that the creation, the physical world around us, might conflict with the Bible is ridiculous. I mean, it just can't be the case, because they're both the products of the same idea. And in fact, there are many, many ancient commentators that say, that write extraordinary statements, that say in the time to come that when the Bible was revealed on Sinai, the information broke into two parts. One part was written down, scriptures. The other part was hidden in nature. And the time will come when we'll open up nature and we'll understand what's written in scriptures even more clearly. And the time is now, I think. Science has revolutionized the understanding of the, of the universe. I give one example. In 1959, and it's a pleasure to see that most of us were around in 1959. Usually when I'm lecturing, I have to explain, because the young students in university, that by 1959, people had invented shoes. Yes, it was, you know, you, you, get, you get a person that's 20 years old, and they think, well, they were swinging from the trees back there. No, 50, and atomic bombs, people in space. In 1959, a survey was taken of leading scientists in the United States. Among the questions asked relative to the cosmos, relative to the universe, was, What's your estimate of the age of the universe? This is 1959, just 40 years ago. What's your estimate of the age of the universe? Two-thirds of the scientists, an overwhelming majority, said, what's your age, the estimate of the age of the universe? What a ridiculous question. The universe had no beginning. The universe is eternal. Plato taught that. Aristotle taught that. We know there's no, oh, the Bible says there's a beginning. It makes kids feel good at night when they go to sleep. You know, they're not scared but we know there's no beginning. Now, I'm not knocking scientists and science because that's what science has to learn. The Bible is fixed, but science has to learn. 1959, most scientists, if this were a room of scientists just 40 years ago, and I said, I'm gonna now show the age of the universe, even a number like 15 billion years, two thirds of you would have walked out because you said, it's ridiculous. The universe is eternal. Came 1965, and two scientists working for Bell Labs in New Jersey Penzias and Wilson discovered the echo of the Big Bang, discovered the remnants of the explosion that we label as creation, the beginning of the universe. And overnight, the view of the world, the paradigm, the world model changed from a universe that had no creation, no beginning, to a universe that had a beginning. Overnight, every, essentially every major scientist came to accept that the first word of the Bible is true. The first word, the opening sentence of the Bible in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science had proven the first part of the first sentence. There was a beginning, an overwhelming change. In fact, in my opinion, that's the biggest change science can ever make in coming to agree with, with the Bible. Namely, it has proven the first half of the first sentence. There was a beginning. Now it's just a question, is it thousands of years or if it's billions of years? If you add up the generations of the Bible, you get to a number somewhat less than, than 6,000 years. The numbers vary. I put a number that's found on many Jewish calendars, but the number is somewhere between 57, 58, and, and, and next week in two or three days, it changes to 57, 59 with the new year. Rosh Hashanah. The holiday that's coming up is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh means head. Ha means the. Shana means year, the head of the year, the beginning of the year. And in fact, when Bible scholars in the 1600s, like Archbishop Usher in Ireland, calculated the, when the creation of the world occurred, based on the biblical calendar, he saw that the creation of the world occurred in October, namely the fall of the year. Well, this year it's September. It varies the, the season, uh, depending upon how the months fall relative to the sun. But in any event, we have a number that's a bit less than 6,000 years. Science gives us a number that reaches into the billions of years, 15,000 million, 15 billion years, somewhere between 14 and 18. I put an average number down here. So, but at least it's only numbers now. We now know there was a beginning. We can never lose sight of the fact that we understand now that the Bible was correct. There was a beginning. 
and has a very good track record. We'll see the Bible has quite a good track record of being correct. Today I'd like to focus on the six days of Genesis, the opening chapter, Genesis chapter 1. It starts with the creation of the universe, ends with the creation of Adam and Eve, and deal with some of the events in there and see if we can't find, based on ancient, ancient commentary and the text itself and modern science, whether or not there cannot be an integration. I teach you a Hebrew word, shiluv. It means to integrate, to bring together, to integrate these two, wor these two worlds that seem that they're apart, but they're both from the same source, the same creation. A fossil, in Hebrew, mi'uban, something that becomes an ebon, something that becomes a stone. This mi'uban, this stone, is 150 million years old. I prefer that Zola would pick this up and not, not this one, since I can't replace this very easily. This is much older. This is the, this is quite a controversial stone among many persons. This is a fossil of a vertebra. But it's quite a big vertebra. If you, I mean, if you consider it a human being, you have quite a tall human <coughs> being. In fact, someone about, about uh, 10 feet long from this size. Because it wasn't the human vertebra. It was the vertebra Plesiosaurus dinosaur from the Jurassic era, 150 million years old. OK? Is it real or not real? Does the Bible deal with it or not? And I hope if we have time, we'll, we can get into some of the, the, the terminology to see how well this might, in fact, work. Whether a vertebra fits within the Bible. Clearly, since I have it in my house, I think it does. OK? And I hope we can get to work, have this work in a uh, way that will seem satisfactory to everyone. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we're talking here about the idea of two different ages, very different ages. So let's try to understand the text of the Bible and see if we can not see how, in fact, we have this integration. There are a whole range of questions that might come up from this, like evolution as an example, OK, cavemen. But I want first to deal with this idea here of the age of the universe. When we look at the text of the Bible, we find something very interesting. As the first chapter unfolds, the 31 sentences that make up the flow of information from the creation of the universe to the creation of Adam and Eve, first thing we notice that there's not a lot of information given. There are only these 31 sentences. Where I went to MIT, the Hayden Library, I would guess we had about 50,000 books dealing with these topics. Up the road, about a mile or two away, was Harvard University. The Widener Library, I would guess they have 200,000 books. Not on the biblical aspects, but on the cosmology, the astronomy, the paleontology, the high energy physics, all those scientist things describing the events that the Bible describes in 31 sentences. So clearly, there has to be a lot of information tucked in these sentences that's very, very compact, as opposed to having thousands and tens of thousands of scientific articles about it. So we have to understand in dealing with the text that we're looking deep inside each and every word. The first thing in the text that I discover, or that I discover, no, really, I'm going back commentaries from thousands of years ago, a little phrase of me to say it, first thing I discovered in these ancient commentaries is that the reason that the days are each defined as, and there was evening and there was morning, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with it, just as a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with it all, Genesis chapter 1? Well, the vast, almost everyone, essentially everyone. Every day ends with the same sentence, v'hi erev, v'hi boker, and there was evening and there was morning, day one, more things happening, there was evening and morning, a second day, a third day, fourth day a fifth day, the sixth day. Day by day, the days are described as if you're almost watching them from the outside. There was evening and morning. There was evening and morning. Nowhere else in the entire Bible is this repeated. Only for these six days is the description of time in the rather unusual and bizarre way of having it just say, and there was evening and morning. The moment that we have humanity on Earth, Adam and Eve, the description of time changes to something where it, where it reads, and Adam and Eve lived 130 years, and they were the parents of Seth. Seth lives 105 years. He's the father of Enosh. From the moment that there is humanity on Earth, the, the description of time becomes an Earth-based description of time, a human description of time. Adam and Eve live 130 years. Seth lives 105 years. Suddenly, the flow of time from Adam forward is described, in fact, in a way that is humanly related directly. And that isn't surprising because what we learn from these ancient commentaries like in the Talmud and in commentaries from about that time is that 
the six days of Genesis are treated as a group by themselves, and that isn't a discovery just from the wording, but M Moses, in the closing days of his life, in the closing day of his life, in chapter, I just skip through, chapter 30, verse 7, I believe it is. Uh, no, I, it must be chapter 30. Pardon me for, I, I uh, did not mark this. Yes, chapter 32, verse 7. Moses is giving his final discussion, chapter 32, verse 7 of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. And he's discussing and he's saying essentially, if you want to see the fingerprint of God in the world, if you want to see the, the emphasis, the expression of God in the world, he says the following, remember the days of old, consider the years of the many generations. Binu shanot dor vador, zahor yemot olam, binu shanot dor vador. Remember the days of old, consider the years of the many generations. De Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. And the commentators say, what's Moses talking about here? Why does he break the time into two sections? Consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. And the commentators mention why. Because what Moses is saying, in a subtle language, because he, he calls the, he says this entire text is a poem. He uses the word poem, a song. And a poem has a text and a subtext. And he's saying, look inside the text and find the deeper meaning. Consider the days of old, the six days of Genesis, the sheshet me'ibreshit, the six days of creation, the years of the many generations, the time from Adam forward. Moses tells us that if we want to see the fingerprint of God, there are two sources of information. There's a clock that begins here, and it adds up to something less than 6,000 years. I'll just use this number directly, but there could be any number up to 6,000 years, okay? And then there's another clock back here that runs for six days. And that clock is separate from this clock, that there are two clocks in the biblical text, one that runs from the creation up to Adam, and a second clock that runs beyond that. And hence, Moses breaks the calendar in that section. Consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. Subtle statement, but enough to have made the sages thousands of years ago to break the calendar into two parts. 